B16A Honda, stock bottom end. How much boost can it possibly take? Let's find out. Guys that watch this channel, and if you don't subscribe and aren't a regular viewer, make sure you do. Push some buttons, like, share, subscribe, do all the stuff down there. But loyal viewers will recognize, I do a lot of big bang testing. And what I mean by that is, we'll go get a motor from the wrecking yard, LS, 351, big block, small block, whatever it is. We'll get that motor from the wrecking yard. We'll bring it back to the shop. We'll take it apart, add ring gap. We usually install good heads cam and intake because we want the thing to make power. Then we put turbos or a single turbo on it and turn it all the way up until something breaks. And the reason I did that is to stop the misconceptions that are out there online. There's a lot of guys out there that say, oh, a LS motor, for instance, it'll only take 10 pounds of boost and then it'll blow up. Or, in this case, a Honda, it'll only take 10 pounds of boost and then it'll blow up. Same thing with the mod motors and five liters and 351s and big block Chevys. All of them, there's a ton of misconception. So for this video, I wanted to find out what was the braking limit of that B16A Honda. In fact, although most people think that that LS, that 4.8 liter, the original big bag motor that I did for Hot Rod, was the first one. The reality is I did this, I did a test five years before that on this B16A. I didn't label it as a big bang motor because I didn't know that existed yet, but this is re really the first big bang test. And I did it on the B16A and what I wanted to find out was how much power that stock B16A would actually take. As it turns out, it takes a lot. But like the other motors, there were a lot of myths about the B-Series. It has an open deck, it's unsupported, the cylinders move around, the rods are weak. You know, there's all sorts of things that people say, it's gonna break. The reality is, if you do it right, it will make a lot of power under boost. But, as this test will show, if you miss just one step, something's gonna break. When you turbocharge any motor, especially when you're looking to find the limit of how much boost it'll take, there are a number of things that are critical. Obviously, the tune. Now, the air fuel is very important. If you're running 11.5, 11.6, 11.7, that's gonna work well. If you try to run your turbo motor at 12.6 or 12.7, and you do it for any length of time, it's definitely gonna break. Same thing, and even more importantly, with timing. Too much timing will break an NA motor, and it'll break a turbo one, even faster. The higher the boost, the lower the timing. This is very critical. Next thing is charge cooling. If you run a high boost level, the charge temperature gets high. You want to have a real good efficient intercooler. On our test, on this B16A, we ran an air to water cooler, which worked very well. Now, if you can run ice water, it's even better because the charge temperature is even lower. Let's talk about fuel, octane specifically. High octane, much better. If you try to run 25 pounds on pump gas, it doesn't work very well. When we run these big bang tests, we always run high octane race fuel. We never do it on pump gas. E85 also works well. It's got enough octane and it's got really good charge cooling. So for driving around on the street and having a ripping good time, E85 definitely works. On these big bay motors, we run 118 rocket brand race fuel or C16 and all that stuff works really well. The high octane allows us to run the right amount of timing, high boost level without detonation. Here's the final critical element, and the one reason we didn't succeed with this particular test way back when, ring gap. You have to have ring gap in these motors. The factory ring gap was designed for the factory power level. Unfortunately, if we add five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds of boost, that tight ring gap won't work anymore. You have to increase the ring gap, otherwise the rings touch together, and when they touch together, because they've heated up, they seize momentarily in the bore. And when they do that, like on this motor, they snap a ring gland. So getting this ring gap right is very important, and I owe all this to Jerry at Advanced Machine. Jerry hooked us up and said, hey look, you gotta run a lot more ring gap than you really think. Now, we've been doing this for a long time because all the ring manufacturers say, look, increase the ring gap if you're gonna be running nitrous or supercharging or turbocharging, and we've always done that, but he said, you know what? You can run even more, and it works even better. So lots of ring gap, no touching, they last a long time. Check all the things off that list, then add boost. To prep for our big boost test on our B16A, we put our B16 
up on the dyno. Now, it was a stock bottom end the way that we get it from the JDM supplier. We made a few modifications to it and we'll go over that in the results video. But we put the motor up on the dyno and I first ran it naturally aspirated. I like to do that to make sure that the motor's safe and sound, everything's happy before we install the turbo kit. Now, speaking of turbo kits, this was a custom turbo and the reason it's custom is because I actually ran our 57 millimeter Garrett turbo with a long tube apex header the same one I run on the naturally aspirated motor that's right long tube header feeding a turbo and it worked very well I just made an adapter to mount the turbo all the boost from that 57 millimeter turbo by the way it was supplied by the guys at HP performance and it was a custom configuration that they had made they actually used it as part of a twin kit for a 4.6 liter Ford it worked real well on this B16a and had plenty of capacity all the boost from the 57 millimeter was supplied through a dual core air to water intercooler from Spearco now this was the same dual core intercooler that we ran on our 2 liter Bonneville motor and we've run it over 700 horsepower so it had more than enough capacity for our little B16 test. The dyno water was fed through the air to water intercooler we didn't run ice water which we could and it would help it make even more power. All of this was controlled with a Honda ECU you know we did the chip burning and stuff on it worked really well so we could get the air fuel right we could get the timing right and find out just how much power the stock bottom end on this B16A would take. Let's find out. To get things ready for our test, the B16A Big Bang Theory test, we installed our basically stock B16A up on the dyno. Now this thing was an unopened motor from a local JDM source. We did equip it with an apex long tube header and basically a three inch exhaust exiting that header. And then a radius entry and air intake tube feeding the factory throttle body. Now we've run this motor both with Han data and with a fast management system, both of them work well. This combination, our otherwise stock B16A on the engine dyno. Now we run it cooler obviously with an optimized tune and stuff so it makes more power than it's rated at by the factory. This one made 185.2 horsepower and peak torque was 130 foot-pounds. So now let's take a look and see what happened when we installed a Turbonetics turbo system. Now this is not going to be our Big Bang system, but we ran this also just to kind of get an idea what a good street system would be. We ran our Turbonetics system at about 14 pounds of boost. Yeah, it ran with that air to water intercooler and it worked well. It was sized basically kind of for a street B16. And this is um, getting up near the kind of the flow limit of the turbo. We didn't take any exhaust back pressure readings, but my guess is it's probably fairly high. But equipped with this Turbonetics system, which worked real well, bolted on real nice, and obviously looked pretty cool. It produced 325 horsepower, and the peak torque was up to 228 foot-pounds. But now let's take a look and see what happened when we installed the 57 millimeter turbo and our long tube header. Our stock B16A had produced 185 horsepower NA, and then with our Turbonetics turbo setup, it produced 325 horsepower at about 14 and a half pounds. After that, we installed the Apex header and 57 millimeter turbo. And I looked the specs up on the 57 millimeter turbo from the guys at HP Performance. So it's listed as a Garrett 57 millimeter with a stage three turbine wheel and a 0.63 AR. So as we'll see, it had a decidedly different boost curve than the smaller Turbonetics because the Turbonetics was about at the limit of um, what it could do there. So here's what happened when we installed the 57 millimeter turbo. As you can see, it didn't come on till much later than the smaller Turbonetics, but even at roughly the same boost, boost level within a couple of tenths of a, of a PSI, it made quite a bit more power. So it was all the way up to 391 horsepower at about 14.2 PSI was the boost peak. What we did from there is obviously go up and boost. Remember, this is a stock untouched B16A, factory head bolts, factory head gasket, all of that stuff. So then we stepped up and boost to around 17.4 PSI with our 57 millimeter turbo. And we were at 422 horsepower. And this would end up being about the limit of what we could do on the stock B16A because we tried to make one more run, and I'll show you what that looks like. 
I tried to make one more run. The boost response was a little bit better because the exhaust had a little bit more heat in it. But if you notice up here at the top, up near 8,000, the power started to fall off. And the reason the power started to fall off, and obviously I d didn't have video of it, but you, you could see in the dyno cell that we were starting to get some blow-by um, coming out of the breather a lot more than normal. And that's because we had just broke a piston, and I'll show you what it looks like when we took it apart. Here's a shot of the piston with the broken ring land. And this is what happens. The piston rings get too hot, the gap <laughs> eliminates itself, and then the piston ring seizes in the bore momentarily, and it just snaps the snaps the ring land on the piston. It's not because the piston is weak, it's because we made a mistake and did not put enough ring gap in that thing. And this is what happens. Let's get to our conclusion. Okay guys, what did you think about our B16A Big Bang test? Here's my takeaway. Make sure you put ring gap in it. Now I know it's a pain in the butt. Taking it apart, filing the rings and putting it back together. But you know what? You get to reuse most of the stuff. You get to reuse the rings, reuse the bearings, just put it back together. It also gives you the opportunity to upgrade the head stitch, which they probably need. Now, new gaskets might not be a bad idea. I like to scrape the surface with a razor blade before I put it back together. Sometimes you don't need to. But here's also the takeaway. Add ring gap, but also look at the other things. Stock pistons, fine at this power level. Stock rods, also fine. The unsupported deck that everybody talks about, also fine. So where's that limit at? Now, we always ran on our Bonneville motor, a dart block or a sleeved block, but those worked well, even past 700 horsepower. Let me know in the comments, you guys that are out there running like 1,000 horsepower B-series stuff, I know you guys are out there. What are you guys running? Let me know, and at what power level do you think that's necessary? My point for this test was that the that the stock stuff, the stock pistons, the stock rods, the stock unsupported deck, the stock head, all that stuff can be used at a pretty high power level as long as everything's right. I'm Richard Holdner, guys. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. I got more B-series stuff coming up, more obviously domestic stuff also. Thanks for watching.